Near the end of his life, the renowned conductor Georg Scholti formed what he called the World Orchestra for Peace. In this orchestra, he brought together 80 musicians from 40 different countries. The idea was to show that even people from widely different cultures and backgrounds could cooperate to make something wonderful together. Other conductors, like Daniel Barenboim, have done similar things. This leads to a very interesting way to think about the orchestra, and in turn, to teach orchestration. What is an orchestra? An orchestra is a society of musicians working together towards a common goal, to create something beautiful. And, as in any society, success is far from automatic. It requires lots of understanding, planning, and cooperation. This is because an orchestra, like a society, isn't homogeneous. The people within the orchestra have very varied roles, depending on their individual nature and training. And everyone has their own individual voice. Just think of the difference between a tuba player and a viola player. A musician who loves the tuba, and has spent years learning to master it, still can't have the same expectations in an orchestra as a violist. For example, tubas don't play all the time. In fact, in the average score, they often have very long passages where they don't play at all. And the tuba player is usually alone. It's rare to have more than one tuba, even in a large orchestra. The violist, on the other hand, usually plays along with the other violas in the section. And strings normally play a lot more often than the tuba. So in a sense, when the tuba does come in, it's more noticeable than the viola. Obviously, the composer could decide to give either one of them a prominent solo, but that isn't common. And this is apart from the difference in character between instruments. People choose to play an instrument because they're attracted to its sound and its expressive character. And the composer chooses the instruments that best express the character they're aiming at. For example, here's the start of my fourth symphony. Now here is the exact same music, but with different instruments. The character is totally different. Neither version is particularly difficult to play, but emotionally, what a different world. The combination of high, sustained strings and timpani in my original version creates a serious, somewhat troubled character. In the second version, the flutes are light and the low bassoon just sounds a bit playful. Incidentally, there will be several other examples from my own music in this lesson, mainly due to copyright issues when I use other composers' works and performances thereof. Also in my own music, I can also show alternative possibilities different from the ones I actually chose. Getting back to the idea of an orchestra as a society, an orchestra can be thought of both as a group of individuals, each with their own distinctive character, but also as a group of smaller communities. For example, in a full-size symphony orchestra, it's not uncommon to have 50 or 60 strings subdivided into violins, violas, cellos, and basses. And the violins are usually subdivided into firsts and seconds. Most of the time, the string players are playing as part of their group, not alone. A given passage may or may not include all the subsections, but it's very rare to have a solo part for one double bass or one second violin. What makes the string family unusual is this fact. They're normally a kind of a choir because all those people are playing together. As in a choir, the sound of one person playing or singing a given line is very different from the sound of a large group of people playing or singing the same line in unison. Obviously the choir is louder, but the difference goes deeper than that. When we speak of the sopranos or the altos or the first violins and the violas, we are referring to groups of people playing together. And there's something quite beautiful about this. In fact, this is one of the attractions of an orchestra. Sometimes you are listening to individual voices, and sometimes you're listening to a group of people singing together. This is called the chorus effect. But this kind of grouping requires a lot of coordination. For example, the choir master has to know where each section can breathe in relation to the text and the musical phrasing. A section of violins normally all use the same bowing at the same time, usually decided by the concertmaster or the conductor. 
Otherwise, the overall musical effect can easily become tepid or even chaotic. This is a good example, once again, of how a group requires a lot of rules, conventions, and planning to function effectively. And a lot of these decisions have to be made in advance. The woodwind community is rather different. For example, even a large woodwind section might contain around 15 musicians compared to those 50 or 60 string players. The subgroups of woodwinds, like the oboes or the clarinets, are more varied in sound than the string sections. As a result, a whole woodwind choir is harder to balance well than the strings. But the flip side of this is that the various sub-choirs of woodwind, like flutes and clarinets, or oboes and bassoons, each have a more distinctive sound. Well used, this allows the composer to plan all kinds of wonderful contrasts. In the woodwinds, the oboe is the prima donna, tends to stick out more easily when the group is playing. This can be an advantage if the composer wants a more biting sound, but if the goal is a very quiet, neutral background, for, say, a violin melody in the foreground, usually the oboe is not the best choice. As in human communities, some people are more assertive than others. This isn't bad or good, it just means that the composer has to take consideration the intrinsic nature of each member of the group. The brass make up another kind of community. They can play extremely loudly, overwhelming the strings in the woodwinds. They also blend better than the woodwinds do, so it's less of a problem to write blended chords for the brass, as long as the composer respects the registers of the instruments. As in any group of people, there are situations when they get more assertive, perhaps even yelling at times. For the brass, the high register is the equivalent of yelling. It's extremely difficult for high brass to play very quietly. In the strings, on the other hand, the various registers are much more dynamically homogeneous. If the composer understands this, they'll plan the entries of the various communities in a way that makes these differences into qualities, not defects. For example, if the composer wants to make a huge crescendo, they shouldn't start with the trumpets and add the violas at the end. Wind phrasing is related to breathing and tonguing. String phrasing is affected by the physical rhythm of the bowings. Within the winds in brass, the tuba uses much more air than the oboe. Again, the composer has to understand and respect these differences. One reason the tuba can't play non-stop for 80 bars is the amount of wind required and the need to breathe often. But the double bassist can play for 100 bars with no rest, no problem. What about the percussion group? The percussion group is the one group where one musician can play several completely unrelated instruments. While, say, a flute player might also play piccolo, the piccolo is still basically a small flute. But a percussionist might be playing the main melodic line in the marimba, and then 10 bars later, re reinforcing a climax with a huge cymbal crash. So the percussion player can have multiple possible voices, even within the same piece. The instruments in the orchestral families have natural balance characteristics. For example, you can't accompany a viola solo with high trumpets and trombones. Generally, the more people are playing, the less possible dispositions are available due to these facts about balance. Just as in any group, some people naturally take up more space than others. The advantage of an orchestra is that there are also many combinations of instruments that are more subtle. So you could accompany that viola solo with other strings as an accompaniment, especially if they're not in the same register. Woodwinds would also be possible, since there are so many registers and colors available. So when accompanying a quiet soloist, you would look for other instruments who are even more subdued. When everyone is playing, some naturally stand out more than others. We know that human perception can have several layers and can also change focus at times. Donald Tovey spoke of planes of tone. This notion is central to good orchestration. Obviously, 80 or 100 people can't all play equal lines in a massive counterpoint. The human brain is not able to make sense of that kind of extreme density. But as I mentioned above, just having everyone double the same line gets great very fast. Given the facts about orchestral balance, there are not many ways to orchestrate a tutti where you can still hear everyone. But once we start thinking in terms of planes of tone or layers of sound, a world of possibilities opens up. In these situations, there's usually a foreground line featuring a distinctive individual voice consisting of one player or a group of blended players. But then we can also have less prominent secondary layers, which can contribute enormously to the overall character. Imagine a painting with a person in the foreground. What appears in the background, both specific objects as well as the general lighting, greatly influences how we perceive the character of the whole. The person in front of a sunrise will look very different if they're in a crowd in dark, cloudy surroundings. In the same way, the voice of melancholy bassoon accompanied by muted strings is very different from the same melody accompanied by playful pizzicato strings, even if they both have the same harmony and texture. Here's an example of this kind of simple texture. In the second movement of Tchaikovsky's fourth symphony, the oboe melody is obviously the foreground. The pizzicato strings fill out the harmony, but in an unobtrusive way. But the overall result is still much richer than if the oboe played alone. The 
background of music sometimes contains more than one layer. A large group of people may share a common goal, but each person's way of expressing it can be different. Imagine, for example, some people singing along quietly, doubling the main line. Or they may be using what is called heterophony, where the doubling isn't exact, even though it follows the same general contour. This is one way of enriching doubling so it doesn't sound totally mechanical. Here's an example, first, of a passage with literal doubling. Now the same passage, but with the woodwinds in heterophony. The difference is subtle, but real. And for the players, there is a sense that each one contributes something a bit more unique, while still being part of a larger whole. This doesn't mean that literal doubling should never be used. If the desired character were more rigid and martial, it might be appropriate. But with the rather lyrical line here, the heterophony adds richness to the texture, creating touches of resonance here and there. In orchestration, we refer to the various layers in the texture as the foreground line, usually melodic, but sometimes a leading rhythm, the harmonic background, including a somewhat contrapuntal bass line, sustained subtle resonance to give an impression of sonic depth, a separate plane that might add movement, making the whole ensemble more alive, little touches of color to underline important moments, and touches of counterpoint to enrich secondary lines. I call this quasi-counterpoint. About the last point, in his revision of Berlioz's orchestration treatise, Richard Strauss says the following, A score with awkward or just indifferent inner parts and bases will rarely lack a certain harshness. Hence, the conductor can't achieve that spiritual participation of all parts in the whole, which is indispensable for producing uniformly warm sound. Strauss attributes this progress in orchestration in the 19th century mainly to Wagner, who makes the point of giving some contrapuntal interest even to secondary parts like the third flute or the fourth horn. This doesn't refer to counterpoint in the sense of a fugue, but rather paying enough attention to the secondary lines so they aren't just mechanical filler. And in fact, this is one of the main reasons for studying counterpoint, being able to enrich background textures with little details that give them some individuality. This has a very important effect on the individual players. Even playing the third clarinet, the musician can still feel like they have something meaningful to add to the ensemble. And the more every person feels like a significant part of the society, the more likely they are to work at contributing actively to it. Here's an example. The melody in the strings is filled out by harmony in the upper woodlands. The flutes just double the clarinets an octave higher. Now here's the same example, but now the part writing in the woodwind is more independent. The overall sound is richer. Getting back to the various kinds of layer in the texture, of course, not all these layers will be present at the same time. But if you examine the work of great orchestrators like Ravel or Stravinsky or Bartok, you'll see how these secondary layers add incredible richness. In fact, often what makes these composers' orchestrations so much better than the average is precisely the attention they give to these background layers. Accompaniment is a simple word, but in terms of planes of tone, it can be very rich and complex. This is rather like going from just looking at a crowd to observing what each person or each subgroup is doing individually and how they interact with the main line. Now let's look at some more examples of these various kinds of interactions. Even in the foreground layer, as with people in a group, there are many possible kinds of interaction. For example, sympathy, support, dialogue, or confrontation. In the first movement of my fourth symphony, we have an example of an orchestral dialogue. In measure 198 to 9, the strings restate the main theme of the movement. Then, in measure 200, the woodwinds, trumpets, and the timpani answer, but with a different motive. Measure 201 to 204 repeat the same process, but with different harmony. In measure 206 and following, the woodwinds add another 16th note motive for their responses. This adds interest for the listener and for the players as the dialogue is evolving, not just static. My favorite example of confrontation in the classical repertoire the slow movement of Beethoven's fourth piano concerto. 
which starts off with the piano and the orchestra in completely different moods. The strings are rather assertive, but when the piano replies, it's with a quiet, tender phrase. What is incredibly moving is how, within this short movement, the orchestra eventually becomes more like the piano, so the movement ends with the assertive theme completely transformed. Here's the start of the movement. The strings and octaves present a rather aggressive theme, which arrives on half cadence. Then the piano comes in with totally different material, very quiet and tender. After some development, we reach the end of the movement. The assertive theme has become very quiet in the bass. The upper strings now add gentle resonance, making the atmosphere even more calm. The piano's final answer, four bars before the end, is in the same character as at the start. There follows just a quiet cadence with the piano arpeggio. Now another example, again from the first movement of my fourth symphony, showing how varying the accompaniment in the given passage can change the musical character in the recapitulation. Here's the original passage, starting in measure 23. The clarinet is a solo, accompanied by high strings, who are playing the movement's main theme along with the timpani. Now, here's the same passage, but reorchestrated in the recapitulation. Notice the harp and vibraphone parts. They add background movement, wasn't present before, making the texture richer. Now another example from the last movement of my fifth symphony, starting in measure 93.
Here the accompanying parts have multiple different layers. The main line here is in the cellos and violas in unison. The bass is pizzicato in octaves in the double basses. The oboe comments on the cello line, first with short two-note phrases, which then get a bit longer in measure 99 and following. Finally, the violins are holding one note in octaves to create a kind of resonance. Now let's listen to two other versions of this passage. First, without the oboe. The music still sounds nice, but there's something missing. Now let's listen to it without the sustained resonance in the violins. Although when you listen for the first time, those held notes don't attract much attention, taking them away leaves the music sounding rather empty. That's typical of resonance. We notice it when it isn't there. But its effect adds depth to the music. Now an example of a large orchestral crescendo leading to a climax. This is from my Variations for Orchestra, the third movement of my fourth symphony. The passage begins with just the basses, playing a motive will become an ostinato during the whole build-up. Then the cellos come in, as the trumpets come in above, with a different motive. In measure 406, a harp glissando announces the next step in the build-up. The horns and woodwinds come in with an enriched form of the motive that was in the low strings. Then the timpani arrive, in measure 409, with rolls for the first time. Then, in measure 415, the first violins enter, doubling the lower strings motives, now in five octaves. Finally, at the peak, the timpani have a two-note chord for the first time, and there's a cymbal crash. After that, there's a diminuendo. The point of this is the orchestral dynamic should be orchestrated, not just notated with words or hairpins. And this is much more exciting for the players as well, since they enter at strategic moments rather than just all doing the same thing. These multiple kinds of interaction are what good orchestration is really all about. The composer is taking advantage of the human mind's capacity to perceive different layers at the same time, and creating multiple social situations within the orchestra. This makes the music much richer for the listener, but also for the players, who have so many different relationships with each other. In a well-functioning society, the members need to feel they are part of the whole, but also that they can have various unique relationships with the other individuals in the group. As we can see, to orchestrate effectively, you need to know both the characteristics of each instrument and their place in the group. If everyone is playing all the time, the result is rather gray. In fact, this is the most common fault beginning orchestrators make. But this is like assuming that everybody in community is the same. It's a sure way to make individuals feel less respected and valued. 
Sometimes the orchestra can dramatize power relationships, which are also common in normal community life. What's wonderful about the orchestra is how it can demonstrate everything from total cooperation, like everyone playing the same line at the same time, to total conflict, and everything in between. And all these relationships can happen and evolve within the same piece. Indeed, part of the pleasure of listening to orchestral music lies in these many different interactions between individuals and the groups. An interesting question is, why does an orchestra need a conductor? Although the days of dictatorial conductors are receding now, a good conductor can make a huge difference to the group. There have been experiments with orchestras without conductors, but it quickly becomes evident that if everyone weighs in on every decision, it takes an enormous amount of time. An effective leader just makes the whole more efficient. What makes a good leader or conductor? First, they have to really understand everybody in the community, in the orchestra. Second, they need to lead by inspiration rather than by force. It's true that in the past, there were some famous conductors, like Toscanini, who were dictators, and they sometimes humiliated the individual musicians, but thankfully that is no longer the norm. The composer's job is to plan all these human interactions to set them up in convincing ways. A deep understanding of orchestration requires a lot more than just knowing the ranges and capacities of the instruments and the orchestral families. A good composer will imagine the effects of the many possible social interactions in the orchestra and multiple simultaneous planes of tone. Over a larger work, a good composer will be trying to give as many people as possible their moment in the sun. This is why seeing the orchestra as a real society, made up of many different individuals, all with their place in the whole, is an excellent way to teach orchestration.